Right, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today um, on this, uh, this quite sunny afternoon uh, as we are discussing and continuing to discuss the uh, EU's, uh, the, the UK's exit from the EU and the end of the transition period which is terrifyingly in just over four weeks time. Um, this is part of a series that CIPR are running. We're doing 11 events in total looking at a number of different sectors and regions how the EU exit process is impacting each of those. Um, but I'm particularly excited today because we are talking less about sort of policy issues and more about people. Um, and I'm delighted that we're joined by our CIPR inside group and Chair Edvita and committee member Dan. Um, and I'll uh, hand over to them and they will introduce what we're doing, uh, what we're talking about and our very special guest today. Thanks both. Thank you, John. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our CIPR Inside Brexit session. I'm delighted to welcome Helen Greenwood with us today. Helen, um, those of you who don't know Helen, Helen's got a wealth of experience in corporate and internal communication, and she's also head of Brexit comms for a financial services organisation. So I couldn't think of anyone better to come and host this session for us and talk about some of the challenges we would face as internal communicators in the new year when the new Brexit regulations come in. So I'm not going to talk too much because I know Helen's got lots of information that she wants to share with you. But as we said at the beginning, if you've got any questions uh, throughout the presentation, then please do put them in the chat box because we'll do we'll be doing a Q and A and a bit of a panel session uh, for the last thirty minutes or so of this uh, today's session. So I'm going to introduce Helen now uh, on the screen. Um, welcome, Helen. <laughs> hello there. Thanks so much, Adisa. And, uh, and, and hello to everybody out there. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you were able to join today. I hope you're all keeping well. And, uh, and, and importantly, I hope you're keeping safe and healthy and, uh, and inspired. And certainly, um, by the sound of things, the CIPR are keeping you well furnished with a, with a wealth of uh, interesting discussions and forums and, and such like. So I'm really delighted to be with you here today, and in particular, I'm, I'm thrilled to be discussing two of the things that I'm most passionate about, uh, which are internal comms and engagements, and then the political, economic and emotional cauldron that is Brexit. And I, I really hope that some of the experiences and suggestions and ideas that I'll be sharing with you today uh, maybe have helped to you and to your colleagues, or, or at the very least, food for thought, okay? So um, a really quick bit about me, first of all. Um, I've, uh, I've spent the last 20 years of my life in communications. Uh, I tell you, sometimes it feels like a lot longer than that. Um, but uh, the last 10 years in particular, I've really focused mostly on internal comms and engagements and, uh, and culture. Um, I've held some senior roles in firms such as Barclays, Bank of New York Mellon, HSBC and Kingfisher Group. And, uh, and I've, I have provided and, and I continue to provide consultancy communication services to firms like CoachHire.com, Money Supermarkets, Waitrose and the WPP Group. Unlike all of you, like all of you out there, I love a challenge. There is nothing that fires me up more than a topic that's going to stretch my intellect, stretch my powers of research and really stretch my, my creativity. And without shadow of a doubt, one of the most intensive and also most rewarding uh, challenges for me recently has been leading Brexit communications for, for a global custodian bank. Now, the, the very nature of Brexit, the, the very fact that it touches sort of political, regulatory, economic and, and emotional touch points means that uh, communicating it for people like ourselves, it requires, I think, a, a level of care and caution that is, that is really quite uncommon and also probably hitherto unprecedented. We've, we've never experienced anything like this before. So, so I think that the, that the level of, uh, of uh, scrutiny that we need to apply to not only uh, the words we write or the words we speak, but, but the way that we do that is, is really, really, really crucial. Emotional investment is so high. If you think about it, you know, livelihoods, uh, schooling, work opportunities, uh, even, even relationships have, have been stretched and will continue to be stretched by uh, the UK's departure from the EU and, uh, and by whatever trading arrangement we manage to broker or, or not broker um, in, in, the, in the forthcoming months and years. And let's not forget also that the information we'll be providing to our, to our colleagues within our organisations 
or indeed to customers and clients outside of our organizations is being really heavily scrutinized, not just by the recipients of our communications, but by, uh, by the media, by regulators and by ombudsmen. So that's an extra level of caution that we, that we need to apply. So with all of that in mind, um, I'm going to cover four key themes in the next, let's say 30, 35 minutes or so. Um, they're, all, they're all jigsaw pieces. They fit really, really nicely together. And once I've talked around those four, we'll have plenty of time for, for, for questions and for comments. So the four jigsaw pieces are bias, conflict, detail, and evidence. I'm going to run through them one at a time and I'll do a quick recap after each. And then, as I say, we'll, we'll have time for questions. So without further ado, um, let's talk about bias. And that's a really, I think, a really good starting point. It's a really good foundation. The key thing to remember here in Brexit communications, whether you're doing it externally and certainly when you're doing internally into an organisation, it's heads over hearts every time. And I know that's easier said than done, by the way. Um, it is important, however, that we put our, our own feelings and opinions um, to, the, to the back and we, and we report on, on facts and evidence and we, we try and keep our, our own personal feelings and opinions out of it. No matter how you feel about the way that Brexit has been run, about the way that the trading negotiations are progressing or are not progressing, depending on your opinion. OK, these are the feelings that you share with your friends and your family within the CIPR, if, if you would like to, but certainly not in your professional capacity as a as a as a communicator. OK, your role is to communicate the standpoint of your organization, the organization you work for or consult for, the preparations that your organization is making, that's your role to communicate, not, not your own feelings or preferences. Of course, there are gonna be people in your organization who have strong feelings, really strong in some instances. Maybe sometimes it'll be senior leaders. And in a, in a short while, I'm going to speak about how to manage those, how to be really conscious of those. But, uh, but crucial, remember, heads over hearts, okay? Uh, facts, not feelings. Remember, Brexit has already happened. We can't wind the clocks back. We're simply now in the next phase of, of this new world. So that, that really then needs to come through in the tone of voice and any key messaging that you develop for your organization, any presentations, any materials that you're going to be sharing internally, right? It's all about achieving balance. It is indeed heads over hearts, but it's balance. Avoid any overconfident statements, avoid uh, any kind of blasé tone of voice, um, any sort of dismissal of the attention to detail that that is required in preparing for, for 2021 and beyond. Um, it won't stand your organization in good stead with, your, with, uh, with colleagues, certainly not with customers or clients or stakeholders. So avoid the overconfident tone avoid an over pessimistic tone it's all balance 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 okay strategic optimism is fantastic i would encourage it but when you're preparing your messaging or when you're reviewing your tone of voice which by the way should be reviewed and updated reasonably frequently in line with in line with the the brexit and the trade discussion timeline try and view it from as many standpoints as you can one person's great news music to their ears might be another person's cause for concern. So try and get input, get a four eyes, a six eyes, an eight eyes check on the materials that you're preparing. And get input, get strategic input from as many sources as you can. Pull on your colleagues in, in HR, in employee relations, in legal, in policy, media relations, corp comms. And if your business, if your organization has a, a program of works underway to prepare for Brexit, please engage with them because that level of detail at some point, if you haven't already communicated it, you are gonna need to, all right? So get your, your Brexit talking points nailed, your tone of voice nailed, and, uh, and avoid as, as, much, as much potential bias within that as possible by achieving that balance. Let's talk about materials. Let's talk about external materials that you uh, research and then that you bring into your organization to use. As communicators, it is our 
role to do the research that we need in order to, to talk confidently and authoritatively and give colleagues you know, comfort, et cetera, et cetera. But be really careful when you're, when you're searching for materials online or via news outlets, scrutinize them for bias. There will be hidden bias there. Sometimes the bias may be intentional, it's called journalism. Sometimes it'll be unintentional and it's, that's just called people's personal feelings. So get your, your, your bias magnifying glass up to your eyes and scrutinize any content that you source for, for hidden potential bias, okay? Even the most vanilla of news outlets, you'll find hidden bias there, you, you'd be surprised. And similarly, if you use, um, external insights agencies to provide you with, with intelligence or political analysis, again, read it dispassionately for bias. It will, it will be unintentional and certain, but be really, really careful. And of course, remember that any external materials that you then interpret into your own organization, into your tone of voice or your talking points, right? It's gotta be reframed into your, your, your uh, overarching tone of voice that you have prepared and that you've hopefully had signed off and approved. Let's talk about location and divisional bias, uh, divisional bias, because that can exist as well. Ensure that your Brexit communications approach is, is really fair and really consistent and really uh, covers all locations and divisions of your organization as possible to avoid the potential for bias. So obviously, depending on the size and the structure and the nature of, of your organization, um, there may be certain areas that are experiencing more challenge, more disbenefits than others. If that's the case, you, you might want to consider a dedicated, like a spur of, of communication, especially attuned to that division or, or that, that, uh, that location, that office space, that country. And that's great. If you want to do that, if you think it's appropriate, I, I, would, I would strongly advocate it. Uh, make sure that you work, of course, with divisional leaders or, or the head of the country or, or the head of that particular office site, whatever, or indeed the, uh, the, the communications representative for that area. Because it's important that no matter the, uh, no matter the strand or, or, or the spur of communication um, that you've identified as, as important to have to treat maybe in isolation, it's all got to roll up into your overarching Brexit talking points, Brexit messaging, tone of voice, and that's all got to roll up into your overarching organizational messaging. It's all gonna be seamless and sort of stack neatly one up the one on top of the other. So work with your local leaders, divisional heads, if you want to develop a, a dedicated strand of cons to help them get through these trying times that will help avoid bias and it'll help avoid conflict, which I'm gonna come on to in a few minutes. Um, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned leaders and spokespeople a bit earlier. So, uh, so, so here's, here's what, okay. Be really careful with, your, with our wonderful leaders who we often engage to, to impart uh, messages throughout the organization. We, uh, we pull on them to, to, to speak at virtual town halls or maybe to, to write a blog or maybe to do a podcast to, to engage colleagues, okay? This is fantastic, but be really careful to avoid any bias that they may unwittingly have, which may uh, accidentally come through. If you can work with them hand in hand to prepare their materials, that, that's brilliant. That's not always possible though, I, I understand that. So do make sure that you review anything that your senior leaders or spokespeople are gonna be sharing internally. And here's a top tip, make best friends with their personal assistants and or executive assistants, because these gatekeepers are gonna be working hand in hand with their leaders. They will see on a day-to-day, -day, often minute by minute basis, the materials that they're preparing. So if you can bring them on your side and they can be your, your, your special eyes, your, the, the eyes in the sky, so to speak, um, then you've got to win. OK, so, so make best friends with your senior leaders, PAs and EAs. So let's have a quick recap on bias before we move on to the second jigsaw piece, which is conflicts. Um, Advita, if you, yes, you've, uh, you've shared our first recap screen, which is brilliant, thank you. Um, so 
Recap on bias. Number one, please keep your, your own feelings out of it as much as possible. It is fact over feeling. Uh, tonal balance, no extremes. Avoid any extremes. Um, watch out for any potential hidden bias in, uh, in, in, in any materials that you source externally. Um, if you identify the need for a dedicated uh, piece of communication um, by division or by, or by area, that's fantastic. Work with those leaders in those particular areas to ensure uh, tailoring appropriately. And, uh, and of course, keep your senior leaders and spokespeople really, really close to you wherever possible. Uh, use their PAs, use their EAs, keep them on side. Okay. Thanks, Abita, that's fantastic. So, uh, so that was a recap on bias, and, uh, and we'll go through all of these at the very end of, uh, of, our, of, our, of our sort of session. So for now, let's move on to the next uh, jigsaw piece, conflict, and this sits really neatly with bias. They, they sit on the same side of the seesaw, right? Wherever you have bias, you're gonna have conflict, and vice versa. Um, and here's what, be prepared for conflict when it comes to preparing materials on the subject of Brexit. There is almost guaranteed to be conflict of opinion in terms of what can and can't be said within your organization to your colleagues about Brexit. And if your role is to lead Brexit communications or, or, or to play a part in it, you, are, you have to be prepared to be the moderator in these discussions, in these, in these times of conflict, okay? You have to facilitate and moderate that. So remember the basic rules for managing conflict through to a healthy resolution. And this is this may be quite a challenge for some of us. I, I don't always find managing conflict easy, but if you bear in mind these, um, these kind of key ground rules, then you, you'll be off to a good start, right? So first off, anticipate it, expect it, it's gonna be there be prepared for the rainstorm, get your umbrella out, right? As, as intuitive communicators, you'll almost certainly know which senior influential leaders are gonna dis disagree with who, okay? You should, you should be aware of who has which type of opinion, how do they voice it, it's gonna be different from so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, so. and, and that's fine. I'm not for a second saying that you should avoid conflict. I'm simply saying, be clever how you construct your discussions and debates. You don't want this, you, you, want, you want this, right? You, you want opinions to eventually knit together ra rather than absolutely butt up against one, one another. So be careful how, be clever how you, you construct those discussions and those debates so that any conflict you have gets, gets uh, going across to a healthy resolution. Don't let power struggles and personal vendettas creep in, okay? They are there in your organization. They're there in every organization. Just be careful not to let it get down to a personal power struggle level. Remind the, the people you're asking for input, this is business. This is pure and simple, getting business done and remind them that, remind them that you're asking for their input because you want colleagues in the organization to feel looked after. You don't want them to feel like they're being pulled every which way. So keep reminding them, ever so sorry, it's a business discussion only. Let's get this to resolution. Of course, all opinions are valid and all should be given airtime. And don't be afraid to reconfirm back to your senior leaders or, or to any people that you require input from that you have listened to their opinion, that you have incorporated their, their concerns or, the, or their suggestions. Use email to confirm things back to them. Don't be afraid of using email as a written form of confirmation, okay? Depersonalize the conflict, depersonalize it. Again, keep reminding your stakeholders it's a business matter only. It's business, 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 business. You need to retain control. It is part of your role. But listen, if you can't, if you feel it's, it's getting out of control, if you feel like, if you feel like you're not able to, to, to move things along to a healthy conclusion, don't be afraid to escalate it. I, I really think that as communicators, we're sometimes scared to, uh, to say to one of our sponsors, I can't control the situation, please could you help? There's nothing wrong with that. It's their job to, to resolve a difficult conflict or a difficult personal situation. So if you can't control the, the, the conflicting debate, if you can't get to your healthy resolution, 
please escalate it, okay? Do it in a sensible, structured way, because at the end of the day, you're not gonna be measured on how nicely you've, you've stroked somebody's brow. You're gonna be measured on, on how, how, uh, how effectively you were able to, to deliver colleague communications, the style that you did it in, okay? So don't be afraid to escalate. And I mentioned this in bias, but I'm gonna say it again in conflict because it's, uh, they, 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 sort of, they sort of cross over like this. Um, with, with organizations that have multiple locations, uh, multiple offices, you know, spread across countries, across regions, etc. Um, be mindful that some areas may well uh, be feeling more of the disbenefits of Brexit than, than the benefits. So to avoid any potential conflict between divisions or any bias between divisions, make sure your comms approach is really fair and gives equal airtime to to all, to all these sides of, of the operations. If you're doing a series of podcasts, make sure you feature colleagues from different divisions, different countries. If you're doing news updates, news stories, uh, anything of this nature, make sure it's fair. Make sure it gives a really, like, like a real patchwork of your organization. So there's no potential for conflict and there's no potential for bias. There we go. So that really sums up my, uh, my points on conflict. Advita, would you like just to, there we go, I've, uh, I've just summarised really, really quickly uh, my main points on conflict. So anticipate it, prepare for it. All opinions are valid. Manage any conflicts proactively, depersonalise it. If necessary, don't be afraid to escalate. Do it sensibly, strategically, calmly. And make sure you balance inputs across locations and divisions to ensure everyone feels seen, feels heard, feels loved, right? No room for conflict or for bias. Thanks, Advita, that's wonderful. Okay, so let's move now on to uh, the third jigsaw piece, equally important, detail. Ah, there are two main aspects to detail that are worth mentioning from, from a Brexit perspective. And the first is, the detailed knowledge that you as a communicator will need to have to do your job really well. And the second area is the detail around your, your own remit, your own roles, responsibilities, and, and the boundaries that you have to construct around you to do your job well, okay? So let's talk about the first, the first element, the, the detailed knowledge that you need. Now, unlike some themes, some, some, some campaigns, some issues, when you're communicating about Brexit, you, you really do need to understand the, the minutiae of the detail. The devil is in the detail. You can't get away with a high level skin. There are, I guess, some aspects to communication, some arguments within communication that, that may say, you know, detail doesn't help always. And actually detail is not always helpful, depending on who you're talking to. When it comes to Brexit, you need to understand the detail. Um, so uh, you don't need to be a policy expert. I'm not suggesting that for a minute. But particularly important is that you need to get a handle on, on Brexit's implications on your industry and on your organisation. And whatever the resolution or not resolution of the ongoing trades discussions, you need to understand those implications on your, on your industry and on your organization, and ideally on your clients and customers as well. So there is decent analysis out there. Hunt for it, search it up. Don't be, uh, don't, don't, don't forget to apply the rule of bias. Get that, get that magnifying glass up against your eye. Strap out the bias. If you can, if you have the budget for it, use an insights agency, an independent, uh, unbiased agency that specializes ideally in regulation and policy, and crucially, interpreting that from your industry's point of view. Don't let an external agency get away with just providing political commentary. Okay, you can find that out yourself. You're all really clever. Make them, make sure that they interpret their insights specifically for your industry and for your organization, ideally. That's what you're paying them to do, okay? Do spend a significant amount of time with your, with your operations team and your strategy team. In particular, if you've got a, 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 like a, a program of works going on to prepare your business for Brexit, spend time with them. Understand any operational changes or strategic or business goal oriented changes that, that they are making or that they already have made. 
um, ask a lot of questions. Don't be fobbed off with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, undetailed answers. Get as much detail as you can because you're going to need to interpret that back into your organisation, contextualising it with the policy change, the regulatory change, contextualising it and providing the detail that's relevant and timely for your audiences. And that's, that's really important. I think we've all heard the phrase, what's in it for me, which is a, a kind of a, a kind of litmus test, isn't it, for ensuring that we deliver great comms. Always apply the what's in it for me test to any comms that you write so that you're making sure that detail that you're providing is, is the appropriate level of detail, right, that it's delivered in a timely way and that it's delivered in a relevant format and, and an accessible channel as well. So the way you structure and present your detail must be specific for your different audience groups and there'll be differing levels of detail that is required. Um, senior leaders may not require the minutiae. Somebody working in ops or, 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 or in tech may require huge amounts of detail. So, uh, so, so gain an understanding of that and, and tailor your materials accordingly. Um, the detail around your, your own remit and um, your own boundaries um, is really, really important. I, I kind of can't stress that enough. And, and I suppose particularly, again, coming back to that whole thing of Brexit being such an emotional um, kind of melting pot, as, as well as the, having the political and the economic and the regulatory overlay, you will quite likely, if you haven't experienced this already, it may happen sooner than you think, um, you will quite likely be asked really tricky questions from your colleagues um, on the subject of Brexit. It may be really personal questions such as, um, what should they do about the schooling of their children? If they're, for instance, a UK national working out of the Luxembourg office, um, as, a, as an example. Um, and some of, these, some of these questions you will, um, you, uh, you, you may be actually quite, quite nervous about, about answering, but gain agreement from your, from your hiring manager, your line manager, your, your head of comms, whatever, as to what your remit is in dealing with questions of this nature. Um, if, if, uh, if you ask my opinion on, on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to be a single point of contact for colleagues, I actually think it's a good thing. I mean, everyone has different feelings, right? And every organisation will take a different standpoint. My personal feeling is if you are able to be a single point of contact for your colleagues who may come to you with tricky questions, I'd say go for it. It's a comfort to them to know they've got one person that they can come to. And for your perspective, it's really great visibility for you within your organization, whether you're a permanent employee or a contractor or, or whatever. So I say, if that's, if that's a potential route, take it, but be really clear about those boundaries. And if you're gonna be that single point of contact, make sure that you line up a couple of trusted colleagues in HR, in employee relations, uh, in, in, in legal, in policy, in corporate comms, in media relations, okay? Because they are the people that you're gonna to have to go to time and time and time again for, um, for input. Make sure that any input that they give to you is uh, uh, go, go through the mill of rounds of review, approval, sign off, and please, please, please keep evidence and audit trail of any uh, query responses that you provide back to your colleagues into the business. And I'm gonna talk about that in more detail in a second when we come on to evidence. So let's recap on detail. And we have got the slide up here already. Uh, know your stuff, know your onions, research and keep up with any regulatory or policy changes and keep up with what's happening in your own business as well from an operational perspective. Your knowledge and, uh, and how you communicate that, it should, it should balance the external, the regulatory, the policy with the internal, the opt strategy. Detail should be communicated as appropriate in a timely way uh, and it should, be, it should be communicated in a relevant way, appropriate to the audience using the right channels so to, so to ensure accessibility. And make sure you're really detailed about your own remits, your own boundaries. Make sure that you uh, have it made clear in your terms of reference where your responsibilities start and end and who, you, who is essential to contribute to your communications for you to do your job well. Perfect, that's detail. Let's move on to uh, evidence, which is the, the final jigsaw piece. 
and really is where everything should come together and hopefully it will. And I have to be honest with, with you guys, evidence is something I've had to learn to love. It has not come naturally to me throughout my career to be an evidence focused person, but my goodness, has it proved essential when it comes to Brexit and, and I'll explain why in a second. Certainly with the heavy media scrutiny that organisations are getting, the regulatory oversight, the governance, um, evidence is going to be your best friend. So be as nerdy as you like about it, OK? Use email as a means of, of storing uh, evidence of input that your colleagues have given to you, that your senior leaders have given to you, and certainly when it comes to sign off and approvals. Clearly, as communicators, you're, you're going to try and use far more engaging methods than sending emails, but your, your email is where your audit trail should, should, should really start. It's your tool to use it, okay? Um, be mindful if your organization has a, an auto delete policy after six months or three months or whatever, you might want to save any emails that, that contain evidence of people's input or sign off as PDFs. And you might want to save those on your local drive uh, or, or you might want to save them on a, a secure shared drive. But do, do, do save them. And please be as um, be as brutal as you can in terms of how you structure your filing system. Because I, I, I have to say the last thing you want is to be uh, approached by a regulator or an ombudsman or someone in your organization saying, hey, could you please provide evidence of colleague communications you've delivered over the last six months? And you spend four days scrabbling around, not getting any of the work done because your filing system is dreadful. All right, you must, must, must structure your evidence file really, really, really um, thoroughly. Okay, be really nerdy about it. It's harder to keep evidence of spoken advice given to you or, or, or conversations. But there's no harm, again, in, in jotting down or quickly typing up advice given to you um, and then emailing it back to the originator saying, hey, just to confirm, these were your thoughts. There's no harm in doing that, okay? And certainly any email, any, any evidence coming, should I say, any insights coming to you that you're going to use in your comms materials, for instance, the, uh, the formal line coming in from HR or from ER or from, or from media relations, okay? Keep evidence of that. Any calls you've attended, any meetings you've attended, change boards you've attended, any of this kind of thing, keep evidence of what, of where you've been and who you've been listening to. That will demonstrate how engaged you are in the whole process. And that will mean that no one can accuse you of, uh, of, of not having your, having your eyes and your ears absolutely everywhere. Keep evidence of your own engagement. And as I've mentioned, if you're gonna be a single point of contact for any colleague uh, 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 queries, or indeed any, any customer or client queries, keep evidence of that. And the final thing I really want to say on evidence, and this is really important, and we always forget this as communicators, keep evidence of any compliments or thanks or praise that you get, whether it's from our, our favourite senior leaders or whether it's from our colleagues who we're providing materials to, if they come back to you saying, well, that was really insightful, that was really useful, keep evidence of that. Apart from the fact that it's going to be, it's going to make you feel better referring to that on a, a weekly basis. At some point, you may have to prove to your organisation your worth. And that body of evidence there is going to be intensely useful. Similarly, if you're publishing stuff on your intranet, if you're uh, uploading podcasts, if you're writing blogs, whatever, keep evidence of, for instance, hit rates, download rates. If you're organizing virtual town halls, keep evidence of how many people have attended, how many people have asked questions, this kind of thing. Um, ideally, the numbers will be high, that would be amazing. If they're not so high, use that evidence to go to a sponsor and say, hey, could you please help me to, uh, to raise the engagement here? They'll be able to use that evidence uh, proactively. All right. So uh, a quick recap on evidence, if we can just uh, if we can just have that final recap slide up there. There we go in the in the uh, in the yellow box evidence. Save emails with input and approval from any uh, internal sources um, that, that, that provide uh, that provide key input to you. Right. HR, ER, legal, corporate, media, etc. All right. All the usual suspects. Log any communications that you issue internally, store the comms itself, store the date it was communicated on, and clearly if you get any feedback or queries, right? 
any inbound uh, 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 colleague queries or client or customer queries, log those, along with any input and sign off and the final, the final response that you provide. And finally, really important for all of us, please, please keep evidence of any compliments, any successes, any, any words of thanks that you receive. Okay, that, uh, I think that, that really wraps up the four jigsaw pieces that I, that I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I might just share this thing with you if, if it's okay. Advita, could we look at the toolkit slide? I thought this would just be useful for, uh, for everyone on the, on the call today. Um, Advita, do we have that? There we go. It's, uh, it'll be up in two seconds. I just wanted to really quickly run through uh, some of the things which, which personally I found really useful um, and actually essential tools when I was uh, heading up Brexit uh, for, uh, for this financial institution. You may find them useful too. Some of these you probably already have. Uh, essential tools, obviously your terms of reference, that means your boundaries. What do you do? What don't you do? What input do you need? Who can't you do your job without? Right? That's all wrapped up in your TOR. Your documented review and, and approval process, you need that. You need your key contacts in HR, ER, legal, media. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You need to have those, those best friends in those areas. Your talking points, your, 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 your key messaging document, that should be the basis really for all of your other uh, Brexit communications materials, whatever they are, newsletters, for instance, uh, regular updates, a talking head session, for example, uh, uh, I don't know, a senior leader blog. It should all stem from the key messages that you've, you've, had, you've really worked hard to get buttoned down and you've got them signed off in your key messages document. Ideally, you need an intranet area for publishing updates, sharing documents, uh, sharing those podcasts, those talking heads pieces, whatever great things you're doing. Your intranet area should also really be where you store your FAQs, and you should keep these updated regularly. FAQs are iterative, okay? So you, you update them when new information comes in. By the way, if you're acting as a single point of contact and you're taking queries from colleagues, that's a great source of information from which to populate your FAQs. Um, ideally, you'd have a, a trusted external resource for research and information, whether it's a news outlet or indeed an agency, if you have the budget for this. You need a seat at the table of, uh, of any other change programmes underway in your organisation. Because ideally, if you can wrap several sort of pockets of change uh, together and present them to colleagues, Rather than, rather than hitting them with a, a variety of different uh, change, then, then that's a good thing, right? And finally, as an essential, I would say you've got to have a senior sponsor, somebody who you can escalate to if you need to. And the nice to haves, the, the, I found really useful having a centralised sort of anonymous mailbox, um, brexit.communications at yourorganisation.com. I found that really useful to be, to be able to delineate between my day-to-day my -day emails and emails incoming from colleagues asking questions, uh, clients asking questions, this kind of thing. So obviously um, monitor it regularly, but having that centralised mailbox was, was so useful. Um, nice to have regular insights and, and analysis, you know, as I've mentioned, if you've got a, an agency that can provide this to you. The other nice to have, um, and I was tempted to move this into essential, but it's not always, industry intelligence, competitor intelligence, client activities. Uh, you, your organisation find, may find um, that having that insight into uh, what Sainsbury's is doing, or you know, John Lewis might want to know what what Selfridges is doing. As an example, having that competitor client uh, sort of watchful eye may be really, really, really useful for uh, for your colleagues in business development or for any of your senior leaders. There we go. That's uh, that's the the spanners and the screwdrivers of my little Brexit toolkit. There, um, I think that probably concludes everything I was I was keen to talk about. Um, so I guess I'll stop talking here and, uh, and ask if anyone's got any questions or thoughts. Thank you, Helen. That was fabulous. So if anyone does have any questions and thoughts, then please pop them into the, the chat function. If you're uncomfortable about sharing publicly about your organisation, then please do DM us and, and I'll make sure I anonymise the names that it's came, come from. Uh, a few questions to kick us off, Helen, if that's <laughs> okay. 
So we've had one from Katie who said, do we have any tips on how we can communicate the uncertainty uh, at the moment, which is mostly signposting rather than giving specifics at the moment as no detail is available? Yeah, that's a really, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's, um, there's always, there's always questions over, do you, to what degree should you, should you feel comfortable saying, we just don't know, we just don't know the answer, okay? Um, I think what I, what I would do, and certainly what I did when I, when I was, when I was holding this role, um, uh, let's say sort of six months to a year ago, I tried to get, I tried to get as clear as I could over the maybe two, maybe three likely, likely uh, potential outcomes of any situation. So rather than just going, just don't know, just don't know the answer, right? The leaders aren't telling us this stuff. Try it, try and um, um, try and get a handle on, is it, is it more likely to be option A? And what are the implications? Option B, and what are the implications? And option C, what are the implications? And, uh, and, and overlay that with, uh, with what the regulatory or the sort of policy implications would be. So clearly at the moment that the, the hot topic is, are we, gonna, are, we going to, are we going to end the year with a deal, a trading deal, or are we not going to? So, so and there's, there's two different flavors of, of what the, so there you've got two options for a start, deal, no deal. You've also got different options within a deal, haven't you? And you've, you've, you've also really got, um, I mean, from a financial services point of view, that's, I guess, the industry I, I know relatively well. Um, there's there's a number of different flavors of policy that 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 might come to play around uh, well passporting is, is a really great example um, passporting or not or or equivalence so you've immediately if you look at it from that point of view do you remember, do you remember those books that you used to read as, as a kid and you could sort of determine the outcome do you do you mm. take the leafy path or the rocky path or do you know what I mean you could almost predict what was going to happen so if you can look at it from that point of view and maybe get two or three most likely options and present those to your colleagues because no one expects you to have a crystal ball that's just that's literally impossible but if you can be clever and say um we you know it, it is clear that uh, that that the most likely outcome at this point in time is a b or c and the implications for us as a business or for our industry looking at that would be done, done or done. That's how I would approach that if I was you. Rather than try, you can't predict anything and that's dangerous. Don't, don't, um, don't do conjecture, but also don't go, I don't know. It, I hope that helps a little bit. Brilliant, I think so. Hopefully Katie, let us know if you want us to expand on that. Uh, Dan has asked if there's any evidence in trying to get leaders talking about implications of Brexit and who perhaps feel there isn't a need to communicate or reassure colleagues. So, so sorry, do, have I... So, uh, do we have any advice in trying to get leaders to talk about the implication of Brexit when they feel that there's no need to talk about it at the moment? That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, mo most leaders love, <laughs> most leaders quite enjoy the sound of their own voice, right? But there are always going to be those who, uh, who, are, who are reluctant, um, either, either because they don't want themselves to appear lacking of knowledge, but also some just simply are so mindful of their colleagues' feelings that, that they, don't, they don't want to lead people down any one path or, or, or another. So this is where you as a, as a communicator sort of starts to move into you as a counsellor, because that's a little bit of your role as well. Um, you need to, you need to, to uh, remind your, your senior leader that saying nothing is worse than saying something. That, that void Right. If you, if you if you think about it, if you're um, if you're feeling poorly, it's 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 terribly worrying before you go to the doctor, and then the doctor simply says, "Oh, you know what? You've got the mumps." Okay, knowing the knowing the answer or knowing the potential answers is is better than just being in a void, going, "Oh my God, what whatever is wrong with me?" So, act as a counsellor and and remind gently remind your leader that um, that saying saying something providing some comfort going back to that thing i said a second ago i think it was katie's question on um um could you could you talk about three likely the three likely outcomes at this stage or the three likely routes for our business at this stage that at least will provide the colleagues the audience with the comfort that the leaders are keeping a watchful eye on on, on what's going on so, so yeah, that's what I that's what I would say. Try and remind them that 
it's it's important to engage with people and it's even important to say look you know as your ceo i don't know the answer to all your questions i wish i did um, but i'm going to describe to you what i view as the most likely outcomes at this point in time and as more light comes through the end of the tunnel i'm going to share with you more that that's the style that i would i would take there yeah and i completely agree with that style and i think sometimes what we need to do as communicators is try and understand what the nervousness is in that leader you know and yeah. try and preempt what that could be and i know with some of the leaders i've spoken to it's definitely about not really not wanting to come across as somebody who didn't know yeah what, you know and, and they're very reluctant to kind of say oh i don't know so it's trying to give them that encouragement uh, and support absolutely i mean i think um it's it's something that we all need to be mindful of and, and I, I tell you i wish the politicians would be mindful of it too you can't know everything right no nobody nobody holds a crystal ball do they let's face it it's okay to say we don't know everything it's more important to say here's what we do know and here's what we're doing about it and here's how we're here's how we're preparing for these three likely eventualities or or, or, or whatever yeah yeah brilliant uh, and a question from martin who says great tips so uh, helen brilliant uh, is there any is there also an ethical practice perspective that we should be bearing in mind when it comes to brexit related communications ah so so by ethical practice um now then would you would you be able to i mean i think i know what you mean would you be able to do you want to do you want to unmute martin are you on the call still Hi there. Oh, there he is. Hey, hello. Sorry, sorry to lob that one in. Um, but so uh, it just it just struck me that you you talked a lot about bias and conflict and striking a balance and yeah. um, you know detail and how much detail to share and just keeping evidence of what you're doing and and what you're sharing. And I it just struck me that a lot of those things are kind of ethical issues almost. And I I just wondered if it's if it's helpful to look at some of those things through an ethical lens uh, so, given that so, given the given the ethical communication is really important to, to cipr and what we do are you are you um are you actually are you literally talking about for instance um, um diversity is that is that the kind of the aspect you're getting at no 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 no, no. so i'm thinking I'm, I'm i'm more thinking about sort of striking a balance and fairness right so you know a lot of the things that you've talked about are, are, are around those sorts of things aren't they so it's yeah. just a, I, I guess it's a different way of looking at it yes um well i, I mean I, I think it's i think it's crucial with i mean with all communications but certainly with something where folk have have, have the the whole emotional investment you know as well as um to to ensure that the way you approach the way you approach gathering information and pulling it all together is just as important as the way that you then communicate it outwards right whether you're whether you're doing an internal comms piece or an external comms piece and um and it can it can really go in your favor and in your organization's favor if you can demonstrate that uh, that you're you're taking as you're taking as wide a group of people into consideration as possible folk from across multiple divisions multiple locations multiple sort of role holders different ages different um you know longevity in the organization all of this so that the, the more the greater the diversity of the people you consult and uh, and and really you know be be proud about that right make make a big deal of this i think that's a good thing it's going to go in an organization's favor it, it you know um yeah i mean i think that's I, I would say that's absolutely absolutely crucial each organization is going to have a different sort of code of practice i suppose when it comes to uh to the, the, whole, the whole ethical approach. So if you can, if you can um, sort of line up, you know, link link in with uh, with with that body of people, or if, if an individual is leading it, take advice from them. How would how would they conduct a, a more ethical survey if you if you're running a survey, right, or, or or a forum or something like that? I think it's um I think if you can line line the two sort of aspects up, it's only going to go in your favour, definitely. And I think it's really important, again, for uh, as internal comms folks to understand what Brexit does actually mean. So when it does come to ethical challenges in the business, you feel confident to raise that concern with the leaders. Because I think where we often can sometimes fall, fall down is when you don't know yourself whether what they are saying yeah. is accurate or misinformation or their own bias. So ethically, you can be in a bit of a struggle. And on that note, if anyone is facing 
any ethical dilemmas or they're not quite sure or, or they're not, you know, they're not certain, we do actually have a he ethics hotline for CIPR members that you can call in as an ethical frame work uh, for, uh, tree sorry it's like an ethical uh, ethical tree thing that you can follow as well to make sure that you get the right answers but please do use these resources because they are there to support you and you know we don't know all the answers and sometimes our minds can play tricks on us as well not knowing whether you know when a leader or a chief executive or you know a cfo share something with you you kind of sometimes take their knowledge and experience as as, as given um, because you feel that they're the ones, but sometimes they could be breaching on ethics. So we just have to be very conscious of that as, as communicators when we are doing something as sensitive as, uh, as Brexit or, or with any terms really that may influence some of the decisions being made. So just, just as a top tip there, if anyone isn't aware of that, that is available for members. Um, just one, anybody, if anybody's got any more questions, then please do feel free to pop them in or unmute yourselves as well. Uh, well, I've had one question that has come in an, 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 anonymously, sorry, Helen, and it says, um, we've got managers, so it's not the senior leaders, so these are line managers, so what do we do with managers who just refuse to communicate some of the messaging we're sharing with them because they don't believe in, in the, the, the out, because they don't believe in what the outcomes, um, sorry, so because I don't believe um, in, in what the outcomes are. So they don't they don't agree with what the outcomes are from the organization. So how do we make sure that we work with those line managers to to get them on board with some of the conversations that's taking place? Got it, got it, sure. Could could I ask um who uh it, it's an anonymous question, isn't it? Yeah, it came from an anonymous person. I was interested to know um who this person's who this individual's um sponsor is. Right. In, term, in terms of the role that, that they hold, whether they're, I don't know, maybe head of internal comms or, or Brexit communications lead. If you have a sponsor who is, who, is, who is fairly senior, this is an example of escalation. OK, if you I, I mean, clearly this this individual, I'm, I'm sure, has has had conversations with these um, reluctant uh, leaders, right, these reluctant line managers. Um, I'm sure that this individual has used all their all their persuasive and, and influencing powers, but if these um, if these managers are still refusing, that is that is I would say to you a point of escalation, right? Gentle, mm -hmm. subtle escalation to your whoever it is that has hired you in to your organisation, whoever is your program sponsor, whether it's whether it's a head of court comms or a head of marketing or even if it's a CEO, I would say escalate that. Do it gently. If you don't have to name names, then, then don't name names. You don't want to make enemies. But if you can get your sponsor to, um, to send a, a, a don't challenge me uh, memo to, to, their, to their, uh, their management level, right? Saying uh, um, it, is your, it is your role to play a part in communicating about Brexit. Please engage with us. Okay, then those managers are going to be they're going to feel like they really, really have to do it. They may still be reluctant, but they'll have, they'll have had that, uh, that, that they'll be under the thumb at this point. Yeah. They'll not have, have much of an opportunity other, other than, OK, I've got to do it. Of course, the other thing you can do if you if you're not able to escalate for whatever reason, maybe you're a consultant, I don't know, um, or if you're just unwilling right, to escalate. Um, if you if you can if you have the time to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with these with these managers and uh and is is there any is there any way that 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 the brexit communications can be flavored not diluted but positioned from the point of view of their own division or from their own own people because you see reluctance or aggression and you know it's really interesting. You see this not just in not just in us as human beings, but you see it in the animal kingdom, right? If you, any of you've got pets, I've got a pet dog, right? Whenever she's reluctant to do something or or, or aggressive in any way, it's because she's afraid. It's mm. genuinely because she's afraid. And I guarantee that any managers who who are who are refusing to engage with you and refusing to to uh, participate in this communication activity, it's because they're they're scared. Mm. probably scared that they don't get the detail or they're scared they're going to get it wrong or they're scared of the comeback or they're scared of the workload as well that's another mm. thing so if you are able to again move into that um sort of counselor space and uh, and work with them to figure out what they're afraid of and how can you take that fear away from them how can you make this a more palatable thing um for, for them to do when you're able to do that 
it gains a level of trust that you didn't have before and the fear goes away and they start to become a trusted ally. It may sound simple, I'm probably making it sound simple, right? It's definitely not simple. But if you're able to take that sort of softly, softly kind of counselor approach, um, that can really, really work in your favor. Of course, the other op op option, I, I just, as I mentioned, is, is, is escalate it. Mm. Whichever way you take, really, it's really good luck. Completely agree. And I think it's, it's often down to conversation. And I think that's where the, the barriers can be faced. If, if you're not having that conversation with those people who are not willing to communicate, there's often, like you just said, Helen, there's a reason. So it's trying to break down those barriers and getting the conversations between the sponsor and the managers who are not probably not willing to share. There, there's a reason there. There's trust or workload or whatever the, the problem is it, it needs to be resolved probably between the, the two kind of groups uh, and you can be the kind of hopefully the the mediator between that uh, well thank you helen we've got a couple of minutes left so just a couple of points before we all go uh, this is worth five cpd points so make sure that you do log it if you are logging your uh, cpd on the on your portal uh, it's going to be available for record the recording is going to be available so you can catch up and uh, if you missed any points and if you do have any questions that come to you afterwards then please do email us at cirprinside.gmail.com uh, or if you join the guild group then feel free to put it in the guild group and we'll um, send them on to Helen and we'll make sure that we get a response back to you as well but we will be putting together a, a like a one pager with some of the key tips that Helen has very kindly shared today um, and also some of the questions that have come through but thank you everybody for joining us today thank you Helen really appreciate your time and expertise uh, I've learned a lot today so hopefully it's been helpful to those of you who have joined as well uh, and thank you for John for setting setting this up and I'll hopefully see you all very soon thank you thanks everyone take care now <laughs>